This is Pocket Watching with JT, the call-in financial talk show focused on helping you get your money right. Jason Thornton is a certified financial planner licensed in both tax and investments. Now, this is not personal financial advice. This is JT's real reaction to all your money and business questions. Are you deep in debt, living paycheck to paycheck and looking for a way out? Call Pocket Watching with JT, the financial advisor for the people. Need more? Book your personal consultation with my man JT at pocketwatcher.net. Now, let's go pocket watching. Hey, pocket watchers. Welcome to Pocket Watching with JT. I am certified financial planner Jason Thornton. That means I'm an actual financial advisor. I don't just play one on the internet. I actually went to school for this, folks. And I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. We are over 108,000 pocket watchers. 108,000 pocket watchers. I just want to say thank you. I appreciate it. The plaque is in the mail. And when it gets here, I'll let you guys know. We'll have some fun. And I have a lot of people that I have to thank that helped me get here. So I just want to say thank you. Now, as you make your way into the live stream, please hit that like button, share this content, and subscribe if you have not already. Okay? Let's get straight into this thing. What are we talking about tonight? Well, tonight, tonight we are talking about the rise and fall of the big baller brand. Now, some of you, very few, but some of you, may not be aware of what the big baller brand was. Now, a few years ago, a very large segment of the Black community was swept up in the excitement and the idea of starting a brand new apparel brand fueled by Black athletes and now have an equity stake in the businesses that they would be promoting, we thought this was another opportunity to build this mysterious Black wealth that we're always seeking after. Now, I have to admit, I'm not outside of the culture. I was swept up in it myself. When I first heard the idea and the concept that this African-American family, right, who had, you know, aspiring NBA athletes, not one, not two, but three sons who looked as if they were on their way to the NBA. And instead of signing up with one of the established brands, Nike, Adidas, the others, they made a decision, no, we're going to use this opportunity and this platform not to make other people rich, No, 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 no. We are going to build our own black brand, the big, you know, the big baller brand. That's what they were going to do. And you know what? I was in the crowd cheering them on. I said, you know what? That's not a bad idea. Go ahead, build your own brand. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, well, I want to show you this quick video to get you up to speed. Why their shoes is so high? Cause this stuff is double mine. When Gucci's. you go up to Gucci and Prada, go ask them why their shoes are so high. Cause this stuff is double mine. Don't get mad. They're at an because. established brand, and I'm an established brand to me. To me. To you. Okay. I don't care about you other folks out there. I have a price that I put on the product that I made for myself. Today we're going to take a look at the rise and now fall of Big Baller Brand. It all started in 2016 when Big Baller Brand announced that their soft launch would take place in June of 2016. LeVar Ball, the patriarch, and Alan Foster, remember that name, created the brand based on core family values and stated that each B would represent one of the three ball boys, LaMelo, LiAngelo, and Lonzo. On May 21st, 2016, LeVar Ball would file the trademark for Big Baller Brand for use in clothing, footwear, and headwear. LeVar would remain aggressive in his marketing campaign citing his desire to partner with an established sports brand such as Nike, Under Armour, or Adidas. 
Bleacher Report's Tim Daniels would go on to report in late May of 2017 that companies like Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour were willing to offer Lonzo somewhere in the range of $10 million, which is a great amount of money for a player of Lonzo's caliber who has yet to play in the NBA. And this never happened because LeVar wanted a billion dollars. So Lonzo Ball would get drafted by the Los Angeles Lakers and in July would make his summer league debut. Of course, his play wasn't the top priority as to why people were focused on Lonzo. It was actually the big baller brand shoes that Lonzo would don in his debut. Lonzo would rock the ZO2s in the first few games, but as the summer league season continued, he would eventually swap out the ZO2s for a myriad of other sneakers from competing brands such as Nike, Under Armour, Jordan, and Adidas. And Lonzo had this to say. Them ZO2s I was playing in, they was not ready. <laughs> they were? Really? What happened? <laughs> like, why? Bro, like, no one knows this, but Demo had a backpack and he had extra, like, four pairs of shoes in there because I had to switch them every quarter because they would just rip. So, like, that's... I mean, that's, if I if I had wow. to say like while wow. the first two games, like the real truth is like yo, you heard shoes just wasn't ready. <laughs> so I'm run. like, I'm on the phone like this when Alan was running everything. I'm like, yo, like I'm not playing enough shoes. Mm -hmm. Like I don't care, bro. He's like, all right, just, just switch every brand next every every game. I'm oh, like, what? all right, cool. Wow. So that's how that happened. I'm like, like if you literally have my shoes from those games, like they're just like exploded, bro. The very next year, the original Triple B's, the Better Business Bureau, decided to opt in, investigating Big Baller Brand's business practices. By January, the world knew that Big Baller Brand was given a failing grade from the Better Business Bureau. And here's the warning from the site. BBB files indicate that this business has a pattern of complaints. Specifically, customer complaints allege that after placing an order, they experience a delay of weeks or even months to receive their order. Some consumers are also alleging receiving the incorrect items or not receiving items at all. Consumers are also alleging poor customer service as company does not provide a phone number where consumers can contact them. When emailing the company, consumers receive a generic email in response or no response at all. On November 8th, 2017, the Better Business Bureau notified the business of our concerns and requested their voluntary cooperation in eliminating the pattern of consumer complaints. But as of today, the business has not responded to our request. Now, if Big Baller Brand wasn't already contracted Controversial. Do you remember Alan Foster, one of the co-founders? Well, he was caught embezzling $1.5 million from the Ball family. Apparently, he only befriended the Ball family just to get close to the sons and eventually make money off of their name, which is really sad if you're a member of the Ball family because Lonzo even said that Alan was like a second father to him. Lonzo Ball decided to sever ties with Alan Foster. Foster was imprisoned in the past for his role in a Ponzi scheme, and the Ball family had no idea about it. Lonzo Ball is suing a big baller brand co-founder. The Lakers point guard is accusing Alan Foster of fraud. Foster was a longtime friend of his father, LeVar, and the co-founder of the family's big baller brand. The LA Times reports the complaint was filed yesterday. In it, Ball claims Foster conspired to embezzle millions and then used the money to buy property in Ethiopia. Ball is seeking $2 million in damages. All right, all right. So let's 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 take a moment to kind of figure out what's going on here. There was a lot of hype. There was a lot of promotion. But once again, we're falling victim of not having the right execution, right? If you don't execute right, there's going to be a problem. So I've got some notes and then I have a very special guest with me tonight. So let me go through my notes just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Let, let, let's take a look at this. So just to be clear, the Big Baller brand was actually established in another state. It was established in Wyoming, right? And then it was established in California, right? And we do see and we have both Alan Foster and LeVar Ball on the LLC documents, right? Okay, all right. So so it was established, but it wasn't until April of 2016 when they actually had the uh, website that popped up. Now, originally with the website, they just had you know, simple apparel, sweatshirts, shorts, things of that nature. But then it, it, it started to grow from there. Now, in March of 2017, LeVar Ball, is on record apparently uh asking for a billion dollar that's what it be let's be clear a one billion dollar deal for this brand that's associated 
with his sons. Now, according to the reports, though, these brands were actually willing to do a deal at $10 million. $10 million, they said, okay. $1 billion, that was a bit too much for these established brands. So apparently, you know, uh, the Ball family or the, you know, the minds behind the brand, they decided they're not going to take the small $10 million deal. They're going to do it by themselves. Okay. They, they decided to do it by themselves. So in May of 2017, they came out with Lonzo Ball's $495 shoes, the ZO2s. That's when they started coming out. So, okay. All right. They said they're going to do it on them on their own. They wanted a billion dollar evaluation for the brand, a brand that had absolutely no history whatsoever for basketball players who have not yet played in the NBA. All right. Okay. But hey, it's black excellence. And for black excellence, we are willing to pay $500 for these tennis shoes. Okay, let's keep it going. I mean, I'm a supporter. I'm not a hater. Case in point, here we go. We've got Jay-Z, an icon in the culture. Jay-Z, icon. Now, in August of 2017, Jay-Z shows his support for the brand. And he even explains about his support in the brand. You know, he said, even though sometimes, you know, uh, you know, the balls, you know, they, they, like the father may say something that's a little off or what, whatever. He still wants to support the brand. But if you actually listen to the quote, he actually was on a podcast and he explained his support for the brand. If you listen to it, you hear him say he didn't buy one. He didn't buy two. He bought three pairs. But he said he didn't get the pairs. <laughs> he, he bought three pairs of these shoes. But he said that even Jay-Z had a problem with actually getting the shoes that he paid for. But he still wanted the support. All right. He still, Jay-Z still wanted the support. Even though he didn't get the shoes that he ordered, he still wanted the support. So I got it. Okay, perfect. Now, here's the other issue. Apparently, Jay-Z was not the only person who didn't get the shoes that they ordered, that they paid for at the premium price of $500 the shoes wasn't coming in. So in January of 2018, the OG BBB, the Better Business Bureau, actually had to kind of have a statement, publish a statement, call them out for the bad customer service and the unfulfilled orders of many of the customers. Okay. All right. Well, we're, we're almost there. In all, uh, October of 2018, even with the bad customer service, the unfulfilled orders, another icon in the culture supported the brand. Yeezy this time, right? He decided to support the brand. Stick behind him. I got it. Now, March of 2019, here's the issue. March of 2019, the co-founders of the brand split up. And they split up based on allegations of one of the co-founders, uh, Alan Foster, they said that Alan Foster embezzled $1.5 million. $1.5 million. So there's obviously some conflicts internally with this Black Excellence brand. And let's be clear, both of them are Black. It's not as if you know, the white man took them down. Both Alan and <laughs> LeVar, they're both Black. But they're saying that Allen embezzled $1.5 million. Now, you may be asking, who is Allen? Who is Allen? Now, hopefully, I will be doing an interview with Allen very, very soon. Be on the lookout for that. Would have been today, but uh, time conflicts, things didn't work out. But hopefully, very soon, I'll be doing an interview with Allen. But who is Allen, according to the media? Well, according to the media, Allen has a criminal past that the ball should have been aware of. There's an issue here. Around 2002, he pled guilty, according to the LA Times, he pled guilty to a near $4 million stock scam. And he you know, served a prison sentence. And based on the LA Times, they said that about the time he was getting out of prison, 
that's when he met the Pauls. So once again, there's some red flags here that really set up where the big baller brand wasn't starting out on the uh, on the strongest foundation. I'll say that. Wasn't on the strongest foundation. So apparently in March of 2019, a little later, about the same month, but a little later, we see that, you know, the eldest ball brother, he made a decision that he was disassociating himself from the brand. So much so that he decided to change and cover up that tattoo. He no longer wanted to be with the big ball of brand on his own arm. And we see that the BBBs turned into a set of dice. That's where we're at. Now, they are attempting to do a rebrand and they're popping back up. And right now there's litigation between Alan Foster and uh, the brand and Puma. Hopefully we'll be talking about that later next week. But I think it's time for me to bring up my guest. And I want to give a, a, a big shout out here. Now, Eli, from what happened to Common Sense, obviously, if you are a fan of pocket watching with JT, you know that he is a friend of the show. We do a lot of collabs together. Eli is actually the person who introduced me to the content of Tone Talks and Breaking Brown. Listen, I, I, I've spent hours and hours of watching that content. When I look and see that the work that they've done, they really have blazed a trail for accountability content that made a pocket watching with JT possible. There's no way I'm sitting here before you tonight at over 108,000 subscribers if it was not for the work that all three of these content creators have done long before I decided to buy a camera and start this YouTube channel. So I got to give a big shout out to all three of them. So I want to bring up our sister. I know Ados is in the building. I see you in the chat. Let me bring up our sister. Give me one second here. Boom, here we go. Miss Cornell, th thank you so much for joining us. I, I absolutely appreciate it. And I got tone here too, but I, I want to give you an opportunity to you know introduce yourself to a very few people who don't know who you are before I bring up up tone. Thank you, fam. I, I absolutely, um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate everything you said. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you're in this space now, honestly, because I don't want to do all this work. I, <laughs> I never, let me just say this. I never intended to, to have to talk about the big ball of brand or do accounting or any of that stuff. I want to talk about politics. But what we began to understand is that this stuff is about politics, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into all the specifics of it now because I know you have tone come. We're going to have a conversation. But I just want to say, isn't it interesting that Jay-Z went viral for saying he wouldn't give a family member $4,800 for a business, but he would give Big Baller brand three pairs of shoes, which is like $1,500. So, <laughs> <laughs> so when you realize where all the money was going, right, and that everything, people weren't doing politics because they were beginning to believe that, hey, I ain't got to do politics. We can do it. We can do business. We can do we can do big business. We can do uh, we can do charity. We can go. So what if it's five hundred? You know, I ain't got to get no money to nobody doing no politics. We're going to get the bag. We run into the bag. So I want to thank you. And I'm, I appreciate that you I appreciate the Eli in this space. I've said for a long time that there should be an accountability YouTube um, for ADOS um, and for and for black people in general, in terms of people who are kind of like vipers in this space. Right. Who? Hey, we don't care if you got well, we we didn't know he had a bad. We didn't know he had a history of crime. Well, that's part of doing your due diligence if you do business, ain't it? So there's this whole kind of what we realize is that we don't know business. We just pretend to know business. We play house with business, right? That's what we do. So we talk about a shoe. We don't talk about distribution. We don't talk about marketing. We don't talk about half of the things that we need to talk about if we really understand business. Then you want me to go and pay $500 for a shoe that shouldn't cost more than 50, right? And you want to say, well, that's my price. Well, you that's usury because that means I'm paying a black tax because you are going to have to spend $200 on the shoe because you don't have the foundation that other companies like Nike or Puma or Adidas have. So you have to upsell me to get the money that you're missing because you're not doing real business. See, that's a problem. And 
I just think, um, uh, you know, JT, we have a, we have people who don't understand what business looks like. Like they just see the end product. We wear shoes, right? You got on right. shoes right now. I got on shoes. You might have on slippers. I got on <laughs> shoes right now, right? So no famous shoes, just a shoe. It's Adidas shoe, right? Adidas came into being in what time? Like it's, it's like the 19, was it 20s or 40s or something like that? Yeah. So what can you do with a shoe, bro? Like if you, if, if this shoe isn't right, I know what I get from Adidas. I know I got, I know how to call them. I know how to reach out to them. I know they're, 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 I'm, I know how much money they have. They do an earnings report. I know they can give me another shoe. They can swap my shoe out. I know where their factories are. This product, this is a product. This is the end. Is this is not the factory. This is not distribution. This is not the relationship. This is not the marketing. All of those other things come into play to produce one shoe. And so what was apparent from Big Baller Brand is that they didn't understand business. They only understood exploitation. And it was just really hard to tell people that. It was just really hard to get people to understand they're not selling you a shoe. They're selling you an idea of black excellence, which is really black mediocrity. And I feel like at some point we have to start explaining the two, right? Black excellence is not black mediocrity. And if you're trying to use me, like I don't have to help you use me. I don't have to help you take advantage of me. And that's what they were doing. They were taking it back. Well, I'm five to five is my price. You just got here. You have sons that haven't played the game. You just walked into the room and you say $500 is your price on a shoe. I just ordered a Puma shoe for $30, half price off, right? It's the same shoe as your shoe. That's why your son is at Puma now. So for me, I just think we are in a space where people say they understand business and they don't understand business. What they want us to do, instead of having a competitive price, they want us to pay like charity to them and feel good about it and say that's business. If I have to pay you extra because you don't understand how to do business in capitalism, which means you need to be competitive, then you don't understand business. And the reason you don't have it is because you don't have the capital. We weren't able to start businesses in 1920 and 1940 like Adidas and Puma. Well, that means we need some, we need access to capital. That doesn't mean I have to pay you $500 for a shoe. So that's just where I am with it. No, it, it, it's a great point because it, put my when you back. think about it, right? <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you think about it, if it was the same quality of shoe, but still three times the price, that would be pretty bad, right? It, that, that's the black tax of, whoa, it's the same thing, but you're charging me more. But as the boy said, it was a poor quality shoe. He was ripping through the shoe every quarter to the point where there are many people that are saying that a lot of the injuries that he's now going through are based from the fact that he kept breaking through these shoes. These shoes actually could have hurt his overall NBA career because he was getting injured based on the fact that he kept trying to help this brand, the brand his father started and the co-founded. He kept trying to, you know, be a part of this so-called black excellence, but it actually helped injure him to the point where maybe he won't get to the heights of his career if he would have been wearing a shoe that wasn't just ripping apart every time he tried to dunk the ball i mean can you have like excellence though without an excellent product i don't even think people people understand like somebody when this is this is not even the shoe that you necessarily always mm -hmm. get um that they get like they're 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 what the nba what they play in we don't even understand we don't even understand that and even when he did it they said he was trying to put he was just trying to put a label on the sketcher that's taking advantage of me if you're giving me if you're selling me a shoe that i could normally buy for for fifty dollars at, mm -hmm. at wherever they sell these sketcher shoes at 6 p.m or whatever you get them at if that's what you're trying to sell me you're trying to upsell it to 500 and just put your logo on it you're trying to use me and i i just think because somebody says black business and we don't understand that black business is often black exploitation and we get caught up in being very emotional it's just problematic. Yeah. All right. Let me bring up Tony. And I want to show, you know, that this isn't some new topic. <laughs> this isn't a new topic. Tone and you have been on this for some time. So let me bring up Tony and just show y'all. Listen, this video is five years old with over what a hundred and something thousand views. Tone and you have been on this. Let me bring Tone up to the table. Tone, you're live on the air. Can you hear me? What up? What up? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Yeah, man. Shout out to you. Shout out to uh, Yvette. Thank you so much, uh, Eli, for connecting um, you with our content. Uh, for a lot of people, I don't think that there's a, 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 a... First of all, 
man, I, I appreciate you sharing the message the correct way. So many people have taken our content and then basically misrepresented the fact that they took our goddamn content. <laughs> and so what's happening to us, I believe, on this space is we've been throttled. What mm. has happened is we, 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 I mean, there was a literal paper that had to be retracted by Harvard that, mm. that basically they had to admit that they got everything wrong about what they said about me and Yvette talking about COVID and a number of other topics. That's the top of America. Once that happens, our channels have been at 85,000, and I'm not trying to change the subject for quite some time because we're throttled. I don't mm. think y'all understand. That video has 133,000 views. And and so, like, I don't think that people get how we got, like, kind of cut off to not allow you to hear these messages that JT is talking about right now. But to get into this subject, I really think um, you should show, if you get at a point later on the show, this mm -hmm. little eight minute video I did because uh, that's the one that you have up mm -hmm. because this this I remember the black business, the Nixonian. And that's the point. The problem with this group not having but 16 percent uh, college college degrees is and having so many dropouts in this YouTube space is there's a history here. So Nixon, President Nixon introduces black business to avoid black politics. But it was never undergirded by any truth in terms of wealth. And so what you have now is regurgitations of that. If LeVar Ball came up to you tomorrow and said, I'm going to sell you a sandwich, I'm going to sell you a jacket, I'm going to sell you a honey bun, would you believe he could do any of those? That guy that says it to you. Hell no. <laughs> and I don't know how you believe that this man could make a shoot. What you saw with the Skechers shoot, and it's in that eight minute video. That's why, I, and I lay it out. I just happened to just watch it before the show. What actually happened is the mm -hmm. first shoot was horrible. Horrible ain't even the right word. It was like, uh, it was like one of them Payless shoes. It was, it had bubbles in it and all that. Today though, think, think, think about what I'm saying. It's not Payless when we was young. It's Payless today. Payless ain't open no more because you can get good shoes even at forty dollars. But what ended up happening is his business mm -hmm. represented not just the limitations of black business, but the fact that it don't goddamn exist. And so what do I mean when I say it don't exist? I've shown you on the Federal Reserve chart, white America has $15 trillion in business. Black America has $360 billion with a B. What that means is that we don't really exist in business, but you got to do politics to get in there. You can't just charge people $450 for a shoe. So why can't you? Why can't I charge somebody $450 for a shoe? Because anybody with some common sense ain't going to give that to you. Why not, Tom? Because in this era, people are giving their product away just to get you to buy the first product. With the Microsoft Xbox, with the uh, PlayStation, sometimes they lose the money selling you that. They lose mm -hmm. money selling you the product because they got to get you invested. Y'all was giving him your dollars that you don't have. And we know that based on all of the stuff that we talked about on our channels just to allow him to feel like, make you feel like we have businesses. Here you have a man, and follow this event, maybe you can speak to this too. Here you have a man, think about this dichotomy, who spent his whole life talking about how white people wasn't gonna take advantage of his kids, only to become the one that took advantage of his goddamn kids, goddamn. <laughs> so what is the point of this blackness if it becomes an avenue for Jay-Z to rent, rent to own, for Diddy to sell Ciroc? For this man, not to sell you a shoe, to sell you the idea of a shoe. I think the margin for Nike was like $8 in their shoes. Well, the, the reason he had to sell at such a high price is he wasn't making enough in scale to make any profit before then. So he needs to make some profit right now. But then once he started getting the shoes, he was nothing more than Jay Morrison. Why is it that Jay Morrison's stock certificate was 500 and then the big baller shoe was 500? 500 is a very interesting number, right? 500 is a very interesting number. And I just come back to this, man. I commend you for doing this show and getting down in the dirt with these folks. Um, I don't really do nobody's show. Yvette can tell you. I don't really come on people's shows. You know, I don't, I don't want nobody taking my content, putting no documentary, nothing. But I came on your show because I can respect what you're trying to do. Y'all know that I've been on Under the Leisure Neck, on DJ Envy Neck, on Diddy Neck. I come after next. So I respect what you do. But what I will say is, I don't have the same faith in these people being good business people. If Jay-Z tried to sell me a Subway sandwich tomorrow, I ain't buying that shit. I don't believe <laughs> in that sandwich. 
<laughs> I don't believe this high school dropout can sell me a sandwich. I'm not trying to mess your show up. I'm telling you the same thing about LeVar Ball. If you believe this man can make a shoe, then <laughs> God damn it, you deserve to lose your money. Go ahead. And your ankle. <laughs> if you, I mean, if you, if you, 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 you deserve to get gypped. Like, you, you deserve to get gypped. And nobody asked any of the questions. Everybody got so emotional and so excited. Nobody asked, how are you going to get us to shoot? Like, if we're talking about distribution, how are you going to get the shoe to me? No, I know my knife can get you thing? to he hit it. To to a, he, was, he was selling it with a case. They wasn't buying a shoe, Yvette. You in the shoe game. Yvette don't tell y'all the whole story. She's a shoeologist. He wasn't selling a shoe, though. What a lot of these people were investing in was the idea they was going to have, like, the first Jordan, like a stock or something like that. So, like, mm -hmm. what you ended up having is that you guys invested in nothing because you don't understand that ain't how you invest. He was, You remember he wasn't selling the shoe, just the shoe as a wear, for wearing. He was selling right. it with a glass case, and then people wasn't getting their glass case. You remember all that? Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, people were playing, yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 also, well, also, let's talk about how, well, and, and then, like, now, like, you're bringing it up, JT, but, like, people ain't talking about it. That's another thing that happens when people nope. fail, they just go quiet. Mm. No the accountability. Sphere, meaning the whole political sphere, meaning the whole YouTube space. Well, I think that the YouTube space feels like me and you got too much right. We got Jay <laughs> Morrison right. We got uh, the, the Breakfast Club right. We got Jay-Z right. Got oh, damn, right. sure, I got Diddy <laughs> right. So we got all this stuff right, but now we can't count. Well, now nobody wants to go back and say, like, how did, like, sometimes you have to understand what, what was the gap in my learning? Like, why mm -hmm. didn't I understand what was happening? Why didn't I ask questions about how is this distribution? Why didn't I ask how much capital he had on hand? Why didn't I ask about the, was he going to be able to use the Chinese factories? Why didn't I ask about competition from Nike, Adidas? Because these people aren't going to let you just go have this space and you have these back. Nobody asks any of these questions, but you say you understand business. I just wish sometimes people would, if you really think you understand business, they have, they have, they, they have, earnings reports and they have they the boards have discussions and a lot of these things are available online you can listen to the audio and listen to the kind of questions people ask when they're making any kind of investment and then people want to tell me well if it was only 500 why are you really mad about that only, i'm not mad about only. it i ain't mad about it i ain't pay for it but you went out and just gave your money where you're gonna tell me you don't want to talk about it because you're not mad about it Yvette, think about uh, JT. Think about this, JT. I, can't, mm -hmm. I know it's your show. Sorry, we took it over. You know, we lied. <laughs> Look, uh, JT, yeah. he, spent, he spent 18 years making them hot ass pancakes. Y'all don't know if you've seen him make the pancakes in the morning. He spent 18 years making pancakes, running them on that hill that he used to show, only to give it all the way to a broken shoe that he created. God damn it, if that ain't black business <laughs> on a plate. I'm serious. <laughs> think about what we're saying. He spent yeah. it take about 18 years to raise a child from zero just to get. He spent all them years and could have made money just from the league. Mm -hmm. And then what you're saying, think about the potential that he gave it all back to make a shoe that don't work. Yeah, I, I feel as if far too often we romanticize business because real business is so foreign to us. Right. Let, let me give an example. I come from a family of business owners, right? Not the Rockefellers, but a family that's been in small business. And I've never lived a day of my life where my father worked a W-2 job. Not saying that that's better, but I'm just saying I've been there and I've seen it. And I know what it really takes, the ups and the downs of running a business longer than three years. Right. But I would have friends who had parents who worked regular jobs. And they always thought my father's job was cooler, right? They always thought like it was like a rock star thing. Like he owns the company. And I'm looking at them like, y'all don't even realize I only see this man one day a week. He wakes up in the morning before I get up. He comes home after work, after I'm asleep. I see him on Sundays. Do you understand the commitment and the time and the effort that he has to put in? Also thinking that, you know, he doesn't have the same access to capital as his white counterparts have. They don't understand that. So they romanticize the concept of owning a brand so much that they're willing to give up a system that makes sense. Allow his son to be, you know, an NBA player at his full ability, full health. 
maybe co-brand with an established brand while you build up your own brand. Maybe take that $10 million deal while you have a Nike and BBB shoe for a while. And then after you understand the ins and outs and you're willing to take on the responsibility of having a full functioning business, you go out on your own. But well, we can skip all of that. All of that is gone. And we just want the celebrity. I say most of these people online who are supposed to be representing black excellence in business, uh -huh. they're not good businessmen and women. They're great marketers. Oh, we can talk. We can talk. We can dance. We can put on a show. We can get eyeballs on us. We can attract attention. But when it comes down to doing the work and not wanting to cut corners, we fall short a lot of the time. Well, marketing is sexy. Like, the, the, and that's the thing we're good for. We're good. That's what they, whether you talk about Ciroc, uh, whether you talk, it, it doesn't matter what, that's what, that's what, that's what basketball players and NFL players, people who market, they're marketing a brand, right? And you think about what you just said. He might have been able to develop a good relationship with that brand where he learned some things, right? He might have mm -hmm. been able to do that. But all that was out of the window with all of that antagonism. But what you're saying is that business ownership isn't sexy. Well, that's what it looks like on TV. That's what it looks like in the rap videos. That's what it looked like. I got my own thing. I run my own thing. I ain't got to count nobody for nothing. That's what Dame Dash said. You, 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 you come in that Breakfast Club interview, right? I'm an owner. I'm a business. I'm this. You, you ain't nothing. You get a, you get a W two, right? Putting down employees, putting down workers, and so because so many business people just are quiet and work hard for their families who actually do some business, you don't really talk to them and you don't know what it took for them to scale, what it took for them to build relationships. You just want this sexy idea of business, which usually, like you just said, we're, we're marketers. 50 Cent was marketing that, that liquor brand. Um, uh, uh, Diddy was marketing. Surround. We're great marketers. We can go around and make it hot and warm it up. But we don't have the distribution. We don't have the factory. We don't have the marketing. We don't have the expertise. And nobody wants to get honest about that. So yeah. look, I must also say, so brand black, uh, and uh, that's why I think that that clip, because uh, it's so complete how I went through everything um, mm -hmm. that, that you were showing earlier. Brand yeah, I, black I got so it up. You, you want to show that clip? I think at least some of it because it, I think it'll give like the specifics because there's a this audience might not all know how bad it was. He he basically just sold a shoe that was selling for seventy seven dollars. But yeah, if you could just show some of that and we'll come right back because I think it's necessary. All right, I'm bringing it up now. Let me bring it up on the screen. Here we go. All right. And here to talk about the big baller brand. Not uh, you know, big baller brand is uh, Levar Ball's idea of a company it is connected to his son lonzo ball becoming a los angeles laker and his idea of his second sons you know this is the gentleman whose son was in the news for getting arrested in china this is um, essentially he's been running around everybody's had their opinion about how he's marketed things but he's definitely got the name of this company into the news but and essentially what i wanted to talk about was you know the larger landscape of what this means about blackness and the completeness of how blackness is shut out in so many businesses. You know, the whole idea was the fervor came from the fact that he wasn't going with Nike or Adidas. He wasn't going to go with the main companies. They wasn't going to give him what he wanted. He's going to make his own shoe. And black America got behind that full throttle. You know, I explained in a prior video that I saw this as either a micro loan or a donation. He set his price point at $500. The shoe market is between 50 and 100. That's a $400 markup. And essentially what you see to, to someone who won't give you a refund, can't deliver the shoe for six months. Everything was off in terms of the product. But at the same time, you know, people will say that his target market wasn't African Americans. And I would say, you just don't understand. That was his core. Was it his whole market? Possibly not, but it definitely was a large chunk. And if you walk through Compton, you see T-shirts and sandals. The, you know, the middle black family in this country is worth 4000 I've shown you that uh, middle black family in L.A. is worth $200 liquid. Middle black family in Boston is worth $8 liquid. You see this reality across the country that black folks don't have enough to be hustled this way. And the reason why I call it a hustle is it exposes the limitations of, like, black business. You know, I'm pulling up something now called the anatomy of a sneaker. And what it shows is the 
small amount of margin that's inside of the sneaker market in terms of mass produced shoes. So essentially the reason why he had to set the price so high is you can't even get to margin on this small scale of printing until you probably get to, you know, $350 or $400. So, or, and, and so, and the other thing is he just don't know that much about what he's doing. And, and what you saw is that he came out with the first shoe and there was a poor design and he had to go reevaluate or something of the sort. You, I'm pulling up that first shoe. It just didn't get the, the reaction because it didn't match the market from colorways that you were going to show. You're just going to show the color that you want to the actual shoe itself. And, and you know, it looked by, by many people to be a pay less level shoe, that first Zoe 2. And so what essentially happened is we come back to what's the problem with his, with his, with his setup. So it could either be a donation, in, in which case black people in large are donating $450, $495 to a man whose child is a millionaire, you know, go find me or whatever. You can do what you want to with your money. You know, when the middle black family in LA is worth $200 to use that, plainly they don't have four hundred and ninety five dollars to donate to nobody. Or it can be seen as a micro loan, in which case it could have been a powerful like statement to the world in black America. It's just this man couldn't be the guy that did it. He's just not selfless enough to do this. And what essentially I would have I would have said is if he was just to try and it failed it, but he was actually gonna say, uh, loan me the money, I'll give you the money back with the shoe. Essentially I'm just using your money high risk to actually get my business off the ground or for that matter give me the money and i'll give you a small share of the company something that actually play to a fair section given his risk given the reality that we don't even know if you can make a shoe and you can't make a shoe that's what came out lavar ball can't make a shoe what he can make is a bunch of t-shirts and a loud noise but not a shoe because what we ended up seeing is a quick redesign of the zo2 to the zo2 remix to kind of compete in the marketplace compete not be the ultimate shoe of all time, but just be actually visually, physically competitive with other shoes that are substantially cheaper. And and the reason why I'm saying that is he had a major problem, it looks like, with his shoe design and the product wasn't and the product that came out, we see with the Zell 2 remix, isn't original at all. It's actually already in the marketplace. He just slapped his logo on it. And that's the point of this video, just to kind of bring up how Big Baller Brand, you know, essentially was saved by Skecher. I'm pulling up an article that's titled Big Baller Brand Was Saved by a Skecher Funded Startup. And what I want to share with you is, but this time around, Big Baller had help from an unlikely partner in crafting the better looking kicks. Brand Black has only been around for three and a half years, but it has had the backing of one of the biggest sneaker brands on the planet, Skecher, since, since its inception. And so, like, what I see here is that's an understatement. This shoe is already out for way cheaper. I don't get what everybody's talking about when you can buy this same shoe. I'm pulling it up now for $77. So you can buy this shoe and for $77, or you can buy, as I show right now, the Zo2 Remix for $4.95. If this ain't a donation, I don't know what is. I, I, the reason why you can you, you can tell the same shoe I'm, I'm gonna pull different sides up look at the sole of this shoe it's the exact same sole what's ironic is that you're actually buying a worse shoe because his logo makes the shoe look worse for me what you what you're buying is a worse shoe because there's no testing look at the colorways on the original versus his shoe which is just black all the way through you know what, what's what's ironic is you're donating to him figuring out the basics of business and he ain't even willing to figure it out he just gonna just overcharge you money you don't have why his son is a millionaire. I don't understand how black America got to the point where they think that they can hold up people that aren't selfless in their pursuit of businesses that exploit the black community. All right. All right. So let's try to think about solutions because clearly trying to turn the fantasy of being a mogul, turn the fantasy of I'm going to take over an entire industry based on celebrity alone. Because I think we confuse the power of celebrity with real business, but we see that it fails time and time again. What are solutions to build industry and actually have economic power? Because 
our time here in America has shown celebrity by itself isn't doing it. Can I say one thing? Go ahead. Ain't nobody trying to hoop in those sketchers. <laughs> I'm just, you know, let's just start there. Like, like, so his answer was to come with some sketches. Ain't nobody hooping in those sketches. Go ahead, man. Well, no, I just, one thing I just want to say, I saw somebody in the chat real quick say, you know, 50 Cent owns his brand. And I hate when people just make assumptions. Like, you know, I remember everybody telling me that 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 Diddy owned the, the all that liquor he was talking about, right? And until he got kicked out. And so if you haven't seen the contract, please don't say that somebody owns the factories and the trucks and, and the employees if you haven't seen that, right? Because people, part of, part of the buy-in of convincing us to buy something is the idea that they own it so even with bad boy it was how i don't think people remember how long it was before people finally figured out that that was a subsidiary the buy-in the thing that they use to market us they know that we love each other and we want to see each other do well so they market it as this belongs to this person so if you ask for solutions jesse one of the things that i see as a solution is that we have to actually get smarter and people have been using this to manipulate us for a long time we want business we want what we deserve. We want wealth. We we know what we deserve in this country, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean we should allow ourselves to be that easily manipulated. There were a lot of questions that we were asking Antonio and I back in the day, and everybody just shut us down instead of saying, "Hold on, they have a point. These are questions we should ask. These are things we should consider. I should take my money and my dollars seriously." If you're going to say you're doing business, business is not charity, and that's what charity looks like. Me paying you five hundred because you say on a show that's what you think you ought to get paid. You just pulled a number out the air. We, it's funny to me, you know, a lot of us will cut coupons and and really think about the dollar when it you know when we spend it otherwise but when there's a when there's an ados person or a black person doing business we say oh we just got to stick together and not understanding that that person is using us so i think and even in terms of what you do jt there are some questions that you that that we need to give people in terms of when you're making a sound investment and this is an investment because you would get you were really paying 30 dollars for a little raggedy shoe and everything else was an investment into the baller brand and you weren't getting no stock so you were really just right. if you had looked at it that way you would see i'm getting used there are questions you should ask yourself before you reach into your pocketbook because, quote unquote, this is black business. I believe, I believe to tag on to what she said, I think we got to go back. Mm -hmm. So before the Great Migration, roughly speaking, I did a, a Huff Post article on this about how I think it's like a hand, a, a car full of Americans on more land than all black people combined. So mm -hmm. at the, before the Great Migration, like one in four black people own land. I think it's like one in four or something like that. I think what has happened is post integration, we have recreated ourselves into failed, successful business people. And Jay Z is a perfect example of that. I mean, let's go to, he understand that Jay Z said that about the shoes with Big Ballin'. But do people mm -hmm. in the chat raise your hand if you remember Pro Kids? Mm -hmm. To my understanding of what Dane Dash explained, they was going to buy Pro Kids and they was going to do their own shoe. And then he went and did that S. Carter deal instead with Reebok. That's to my understanding. Let's go back to the Kanye video. How many people in the chat remember that three days before Kanye got shut down, I told everybody they will drop him tomorrow. And a lot of people in my chat said it's impossible. I'm saying all this to say to you, there is this world created, this fantastical Nixonian black business world that has been manipulated post integration and black folks use the ones that you talk about JT to sell mm -hmm. black folks emptiness. They use your be belief in a business that did not happen because we did not do politics to sell you fake business. So let me give you an answer of what I mean. If we was going to do a business vet, would we start with shoelaces? God damn. <laughs> That's the upset. You're going to start with shoelaces. So we ain't going to do no peanuts. We ain't going to do no oranges. We ain't going to do no wheat. We ain't going to do no I'm going to start with sofas. I'm going to start with sofas. I got your love mm -hmm. seat. I got your. We're going to start with, sh with shoelaces. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm telling you, ask yourself, why are they selling this? And what we're finding now is most of these businesses are predatory businesses to sell poor people exploitation. Rent to own, Uber, Grubhub, because maybe that's all y'all can give people is to get exploited. 
So I, I, I think that we got to be honest about what this group is right now. Then we got to be honest about, do we need another person selling us more tennis shoes? And ask the question, why we can't sell none of the regular stuff in this country? Oh, that's because we ain't do politics. And that means the real solution is jointadolf.com. Shout out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let me just say one other thing, JT, right before you, I don't mean to cut you off. Nope. Nope. I, I want to implore everybody to understand, you do not have to take an L for somebody to get rich, even if that person looks like you. Even if that person comes from what you come from. Like, if, if, if they're telling you this is capitalism and this is business, Right. Somebody doesn't have to sell you flashcards that you could get at ten dollars at Walmart and they sell it for 20. And they tell you that you got to take the You got to take the ten dollar hit, the ten dollar Negro tax so that they can get rich. That person does not love you. That's that's what I I think. That's one thing I want to say. This is a competitive market. And us being ADOS does not mean that market stops being competitive. And if you tell me that I have to take a L in order for you get to, for you to get rich, that's problematic. And that's how you have to think of it. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. Now, listen, we got the link in the chat. I want to give people an opportunity to ask questions. I don't know how much time I have left with these two great content creators, some people who like I, 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 I saw, saw I saw one. I saw one already, JT. You got some. <laughs> I saw one. You know, I like to pull them out. I pull them out by the by they look. You remember the duck tail? <laughs> pull them out and cry. So, right, so so we, we, we're going to do some question and answers. There's a link in the <laughs> chat. You can hit the link in the chat, and I'll do the best I can to bring you up uh, and go over this. But it looks like Tone got a question. You got a question you want to answer? Uh, no, it was, an, it, was a, it was a statement. And he said, we need to manufacture our own. Look, I'm not trying to start nothing. But Claude manufactures some fish, and he couldn't get the fish done. The reality is you got to ask yourself, how many of y'all know somebody that owns a high rise that owns a whole lot of land. A lot of us now are at a point where we might not know nobody with $10,000, but we sit up and talk about, we need to just start building. Where? Do you not understand what blackness is, what they have done here? What you have to do is deconstruct the realities of who you are before you can move forward. But y'all just want to move forward. Y'all want to take a baby and go race Usain Bolt. And I don't think that we also understand white oppression and the way white people have eaten all of the opportunities. So this whole manufacturing, I guess maybe we're going to do it in your apartment. We're going to manufacture a whole shoe business in your apartment. They got a backyard. You got to tell people what acreage you need for this stuff, too, because people say, I got some land. My uncle over here. Like, I, I really don't think we understand what undergirds business. Like, what the product you see is just the end. There's a whole layer of relationships. There's a whole layer of capital. There's a whole layer of distribution. There's a whole layer of marketing. There's a whole layer of a whole lot of stuff that undergirds that end product. So you being able to say, I think I can make that product is not good enough. Yes, you can go and you can go. You can make the best cake in the world. It could be better than what's on your store aisle. But that store, that store aisle at Marie out calendar's cake, which is not nearly as good as what you cook on Thanksgiving. She has a has a whole has a whole network of, of, of making it and distribution and mechanization of how the recipes go in that cost millions of dollars that you do not have. And that's the key. And we gotta be honest about how these businesses, JT. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I remember talking to Freeway Rick about this. I ain't trying to bring him into this. And he was talking about trying to get from the dope money into like hair care. Now them Koreans wasn't wasn't allowing nobody to get no S curls. <laughs> like no, like I, I don't think we understand. We are ADOS, meaning I'm not talking about being a, a American descent of slavery. I'm talking about the consequence of not having a home country. We're not tied to a secondary land and a secondary set of resources. While you're talking about people that might come from have family at a factory with rubber or a family at a factory that do hair care products. There are there are whole oppressive in, um, ways to keep us out of industries as well, like shoes. Go ahead. No, and like like to follow up on your point, one of the things that happened even with the hair care is that they were calling up, telling people in their country, don't sell to these Negroes when they try to come and get the fake hair. Like right, so so that happened because that's who they were. So there are a lot. There's a myriad of ways that we get locked out of things, and you have to open up those industries, and you open up those industries to politics. But then you also need capital. So even whether you're talking about reparations, whether you're talking about SBA loans, you have to you have to have a way to access capital in America because you cannot do this thing where you just put five dollars together. You put five, you put five, you put ten, and all of a sudden we do that. Hey, you got people that can't even do a YouTube channel together. They fall out. 
right? <laughs> they can't even split the YouTube money. They got you got to go your way because we, we we this split was supposed to be different. You know, we gonna throw hands. We all know how that stuff has happened, right? So imagine a bunch of people pooling their money together. And another thing, we got to stop listening to stuff that was said in 1965. I don't have any hate on anybody or any of our, any of our leaders during that time period, but this is a different globalized, mechanized, locked in America. So you also have to change with the times. Don't quote me nobody from back then talking about business when this is 2023. They could not have imagined what America looks like today. And they were not speaking to a 2023 America. And we have to understand that. Regurgitation is not creation. You have to create something new. Don't just regurgitate what leaders told us in 63, 64, and 65 about putting $5 together and putting together a fish fry or whatever. That's not today. All right, let's go to the phone calls. We're going to the phone lines. I believe we have Kiera Underwood. So let me bring up Kiera Underwood. You're live on the air with Pocket Watching with JT. What's going on? Hey, JT. Um, uh, and this is K Journey, by the way. I'm using my other login. I don't know why today, but hi, y'all. I'm loving this conversation. And I want to let you know that you have inspired me to go back to school, even though I have a degree in sociology. Okay. I. I, for the past 15 years, I've worked in human capital management and I specialize in business and payroll taxes, right? And so, and I'm really good at what, what I do so much so that when I have a client and I can kind of gauge that they are black, <laughs> I schedule a call back. And the okay. reason for that is because I listen to these people online talk about business, business, business. They can't even get their payroll correct. I got bust out by a client because he couldn't get his tax clearance from Philadelphia. Well, sir, <laughs> you registered for an account in Philly, having filed taxes, joined a payroll company. You are still not out the clear. You have estimated liability, sir. Like you can't do that. So I had to call him back like, hey, baby, you don't have to just worry about payroll tax. You have business taxes to worry about. Here's what you need to do. Let me call around and find a CPA or a financial advisor near you. They you ha to the point where I have to tell clients, why are you paying this employee as a 1099? There are certain federal or state criteria, critical elements you have to hit to pay yeah. someone as a 1099. And then these people are upset when they don't get a refund at the end of the year. You're not a vendor or a contractor. What are you doing? But and to the young lady's point, there's levels to this. The company I work for has acquired a lot of payroll companies. And at the same time, a lot of C-suite and above people have started some of these newer payroll companies, but they politic. They did a lot of politicking around during their career with my company and opened up a competitive company. They figured out where we were weak and they went and created their own and they're giving us a run for our money. They're still not us, but they're giving us a run for our money. But on the basic level of payroll, JT, basic yes. level of payroll, yeah. you don't yeah. listen to these people because they don't. If they can't get payroll right, even with a provider, hmm. it's a problem. Yeah. You can't I, I, I want to speak on this. I want to speak. This. this is a great point because it circles back to the point that everyone on the panel was talking about. When it comes to a black business, a lot of times we are overcharging and we're trying to create a GoFundMe or you know whatever to the point of because we're undercapitalized. Here's why a lot of small businesses have problems with payroll taxes, because if you're not a business owner, you don't even understand what payroll taxes are. But in general, when you're a business owner, the government, both the federal government and the state government, if your state government, a government has an income tax, you are a third party uh, a conduit for the government, meaning when you have employees you are taking money out of your employees' payroll and then for taxes, and you are remitting it to the government for them. It's your job to do that. But because so many Black businesses are underfunded, they know they have a float, right? Because those payroll tax returns are quarterly tax returns, meaning you file them every three months. So every time they take $100 or $300 out of each one of their employees' paychecks, it goes into an account. They don't have to immediately give it to the IRS or to the state. It sits there. When you're an underfunded business, you look at that account and say to yourself, 
I can do something with that money, even though you know it's not yours, even though you know that is your employee's tax money that you're supposed to give to the government, but you've got three months to do it. So what do many of them do? They borrow from that money. They use that money to help fund their underfunded business. They buy inventory with it. They pay for overhead with it. But then they say to themselves, I'm going to be able to flip the money fast enough where it will be back in place when it's time for me to file the 941 quarterly tax returns. But it never happens like that. They attempt the flip, but the flip doesn't happen. So then when the quarter comes, they'll either file the tax return and not remit the money, or they just won't file the tax return. And they'll, they'll lie to themselves. Oh, next quarter, I'll make up enough money to make up the difference. And you end up in a perpetual situation where these businesses are functionally shut down because of back payroll taxes. And here's something that most of you don't know either. When it comes to payroll taxes, if the company is dissolved, it goes out of business, that tax liability does not go away. Preach. The IRS will assign that tax liability to the person most responsible for remitting it. I have clients who come to me with a business that has been defunct for well over five, six years, but they still owe hundreds of thousands of dollars of payroll taxes for that defunct business because it follows you around because it is what they consider a trust account. The IRS is trusting that the business owner will withhold taxes for their employees, then remit it to them. That 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 is a can, great thing. Can, can I add Thank something you. as well? Can I add something yeah. as well? Go right ahead. So um in 2018, I did a paper called What We Get Wrong About Closing the Racial Wealth Gap. It feels like I'm not gonna say 10%, but like there's several people in the in the I read the chat that need to read about myths because black banking is a myth. It's, we, it's like it's just like made up things. But I want to share one thing that goes right to what you guys are talking about that was in the entrepreneurial section because it is a myth that entrepreneurship can close this scale of a gap without uh, immense amounts of government intervention. In reality, the data paints a daunting picture for diversity in entrepreneurship. According to the U.S. Census Bureau's survey of business owners, which is conducted every five years, over 90% of Latino and black firms do not have even one employee other than themselves. The proportion of owner only firms reaches a high of close to 98% for the subgroup of black female led businesses, which points to undercapitalization. And I don't think most people even know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Going to the next caller, we have Def Dabster, I believe. Def Dabster, let me bring you up to pocket watching with jt give me one second death you're live on there what's going on what's up jt how you doing man i'm doing good man thanks for calling in yeah already um i've been a huge supporter i followed yvette and i follow tone for a minute you know what the problem is with y'all <laughs> what you, you present reality <laughs> well like, we like to pipe dream like mm -hmm. you guys speaking on business even my perspective on business changed a little bit really a lot bit after tuning into y'all because you deal with the reality of it and a lot of times reality goes against our hope and our dreams because y'all deal with the real work right we almost look at all this stuff as an nft i want to buy uh five dollars worth of chicken wings flip it get a hundred bucks right take 90 bucks turn that into 2500 and then next thing you know right you gonna holler at me you gonna say hey this dude's a great businessman you gonna put me on your page and boom i just blow up and all this is supposed to happen in the next 60 days jt <laughs> <laughs> It, it doesn't help when you have so-called black media and podcasts and all these other outlets who are selling the dream. 
They're selling that because they have a course to teach you how to set up your sales funnel, how to make your Instagram post so that you can sell more of your chicken and you'll be a chicken millionaire. You'll be rivaling KFC in about three to four years if you just follow their blueprint. It's just, it's a sad hamster wheel of just going over and over and over again. It's like, it's, it's sad to see that there's so many people whose aspirations is good. To aspire to be great is good. But there's no one really other than, you know, the people here on this panel and so many, I mean, there's others, but it's like the voice is so low who actually talk about the extreme hard work and sacrifice it takes to actually build a functioning business, not a brand. You can build a brand in today's social media era. Brand building is doable, but functioning, scalable business building in industries that are not sexy, I feel like no one wants to do that anymore. What does the panel have to say? Well, let me say one thing. Let me just say one thing. I don't feel like nobody wants to do it anymore either. Like that, nobody, that's not the sexy part. People just want to be like, I'm a boss. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but I want to say something else too. Like JT, I watched your show. Um, what that, the one where that lady was real rough with you. <laughs> I don't know, when she was like, you was trying to read and you was like, I read slow. She was like, hurry up, hurry up. I watched that show and I, I, I enjoyed that show. It was a masterful, you did a, it was a masterful questioning. You, you, you tried to disarm her enough, but you disarmed her enough when she stayed on the show and everybody really it was revealed what she what she was doing and and what she was up to without, you know. So it was a great show. I loved it. I watched it too. But one of the things I will say is people can't just show up for that show. Like, I think you had like 5,000 people in the chat for that right. show, right? Right, yeah. It's like 1.7 in the chat now for this show. That, you can't be, people, y'all got to stop incentivizing people just to do the show that's entertaining, Right. Because if you keep incentivizing people just to do the show that's entertaining, then it's hard to do the other shows that are good for you and good for you financially and help you learn because you incentivize only that other show. So I think something that happens is you have to be consistent with the people who you watch on YouTube who you think do good work. JT does good work here. You got to show up for this show or whatever show he does that is something that's good for you. The same way you show up for the show where that woman was like, like she was going to reach out there and grab him and tussle with him. You got to show up the same kind of way because you're still going to learn something, right? It's still, it's still food. It's vegetable. It's not popcorn. It's vegetables. But that's good for you. And that builds you up. That's what builds your muscles, bones, and all that stuff. It's not good. It's not sweet. It's not always fun. But it's necessary. Yes, yes, yes. Listen, there's a lot of people in the back. I'm going to try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get to y'all, but let me be extremely clear. We got to get straight to the point <laughs> with these calls because I don't want to keep our guests here all night long. All right. And I want to go to bed at some time, too. So I'm going to get through these calls. If you have questions, let's get straight to the questions. I have uh, Chris Woods. I have Alan. I have John. I have uh, Zach. And I also have Chris. So let me get there's two Chris here, Chris Woods, Chris Woods. Let me get you on the show. Give me one second to pull you up. There you go. Chris Woods, you're live on air. What's going on? Hey, what's up, JT? Mm -hmm. uh, and the panel, peace to y'all. I just love the fact that, you know, business is the topic and people skip, like the sister said earlier, people skip all the non-sexy parts of business, the paperwork, mm -hmm the studying, the failures that you have to go through to be profitable or to be recognized because they see stuff on social media and, you know, see people blow up and then next thing you see them in the news and find out they scam. It's just, it just don't work like that. And you really need a team around you. You need experts, people who know more than you, people who are mm -hmm. realize in certain fields to teach you how to do business. You don't just do business and make money. And then that's just it. That, it don't work like that. And I think I can say for the last seven years, you know, people calling themselves bosses and CEOs and all of this other stuff. It's just been a bunch of filler and a bunch of um, people just getting online, just saying a bunch of stuff and people just gravitating to it, thinking that, Oh, I can do that. And it's just not the idea that you can't, but 
you don't know how they did that. Whatever they're telling you, you know, they're just telling you the end goal, like the sister pointed to earlier. Right. Like they're showing you the sexy part, but they're not showing you the ugly part where you had to get it out the mud, where you had to fail at something. And then we leave uh, customer service out of it too. Like to say, I shouldn't, it shouldn't be $450, you know, for me to buy your product. I have nothing to compare to it. You know, you don't, you don't know any real sneaker heads to know how the sneaker market works. Like, what are you comparing your shoe to? Cause I'm a sneaker head. So, and I just find it, you know, people just got, they just don't know how to do business. They don't know how to operate. They don't know how to connect to people. And I'm just like, you know, this is, you know, a skill set. Like you can't just, mm -hmm. you know, just do business out of nowhere. Like you got to learn how to do this stuff. And the first part, you got to know how to talk to people. You got to know how to connect to people. You got to know how to scale a business. You got to know how to write a business plan, you know, a profit and loss statement, how much you got to spend, how much time it takes, you know, to pick up this product, how much uh, it's going to cost. That? Okay. Hello? I, not to be long-winded, but I'm just saying, like, people just miss all of this stuff. This stuff is not, uh, you know, something you can just pick up and just do. It don't work like that. Can I, can I add to make a point to that? Because I, I, was, I was off the uh, stage for a second, JT. Go ahead, because he, he's, he's breaking in and out a little bit. Go ahead, Tom. So um, y'all know that um, I talked to Byron. You're, yeah, you're on. yeah I, I talked to Byron Allen, who owns the Weather Channel a lot like when i talk to him i talk to him a lot so i look at like the different experiences i've had from talking to freeway rick with this dope game and really getting into how that all worked you know how that money was the behind the hip-hop and all that to these uh academics and talking about like the data behind wealth to then byron and like that's the top of black wealth whether you know it or not he owns the weather channel but the point i was gonna make is this I think we're in an era where we're post-racial while holding on to blackness. So like when I, even in the context of this conversation, race is far too little in this conversation. Like, nah, uh, race. Let me give an example. This mm -hmm. is not for me. This is from the dude that owned the weather channel. So I don't need no secondary opinions about what you think or what I think. I'm telling you, this is what it went down. So black people used to own land and could have owned Comcast. What happened was they wouldn't give black people the loans to do the fiber optic cables in their towns, in their cities. Even right now, you see some towns, they actually kick Comcast out and do their own fiber optics. And then they have a, a co-op or something like that. What I'm saying to you is they would not give black people the loans to do the fiber optics. But as soon as you sell that part of the land, they get a white person the loan to do the fiber optics. What we're not understanding is we're not in business because we weren't even set up to be in business. And I, I really think that even in the tenor of some of this conversation, there is a Nixonian element many of you were born into that you don't really even understand. It's part of your ethos and really don't make no sense. I can tell you all day that white people own 98% of the land. And if you tell me back that we should manufacture, you don't make no goddamn sense. I can tell you all day that 98% of black female businesses don't have an employee. But if you tell me back that you're going to start a business and have a thousand employees, I don't know what to tell you. And I'm saying this not to be defeatist. I'm saying this to say the lay of the land is race set up a context where we were not only going to lose, but we were going to be preyed on. Part of the reason that you have to do politics first is you got to stop being preyed on and you got to force government to force other people to help you do business. Let's look at radio. I'm just I'm, I'm going to be real short, JT. Mm -hmm. Black people used to own little radio stations. That's how we got right. musicians turning over, James Brown and all them. They used to, the reason we were able to own radio is they didn't allow monopolies. Well, Bill Clinton in 96 passed the Telecom Act. With that act, he allowed people to come in and sweep in and basically buy up all our radio. So all of a sudden, we don't even own media. We don't have nighttime talk radio. I'm saying all this to say that race and this post-racialism while holding on to blackness is a major problem and reason why we can't do no black politics and get no black business. Good point. All right, we're getting through these phone calls I have coming up. We have Alan. Alan, you are coming up. Let me bring you up right now. Alan, you're live on air. What's going on? 
Hey, love the show. Hopefully you can hear me real good. Uh, I got to run, so I'm going to be real quick. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, discontent, discontent for, you know, the, the big baller brand, but I want to kind of bring a little bit of opposition to that. I mean, what about corporate sabotage? I know that the big baller brand was dealing with a lot of uh, a, a, a political warfare and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, they were they were on the, you know, ESPN was was giving them hell and they were doing a lot of advertising. They was on the news and a lot of people were giving them hell. And um, I, I know they was fighting back. And I know that that, that sabotage plays a, li a little bit of a role in the situation. We know how ruthless white corporate well, corporate uh, corporations and, and politics get. And uh, not just on, on a theory level, but also, um, you know, just just on a, on, a, on a practical level that there's a lot well, of, you know, I just made. you can't do this business without joining ADOS. You don't get to do this business and not have ADOS involved. Well, I disagree. I, 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 I disagree. You can disagree all you want, but they they suing each other now. Okay. I'm well, telling well, you that well, you gotta do my, politics. No, hold on. Well, respectfully, I, I, I had a quick, oh, I had a quick comment. I had a quick comment. I had a quick comment. But you making the wrong comment? I just made the whole point. I just I had a quick comment, point. man. I I just made the whole point and told you exactly reason why. And what you came in is took the race well, out, but left the consequence in. Then when I okay. tell you, you got to do politics, you say I don't want to do that. Well, don't get no business. Well, well, well here, here's the thing. It's, uh, respectfully, you know, quick comment. I, I got to run real quick. And, you know, hit right. dogs hollering, it feels like, because you jumped in real quick and got mad. You know, I've been listening to you mad. guys respectfully. You I, I, I got, you know, I was listening to you guys respectfully. But, but you know, I think politics is the problem. And a lot of people in this world thinks politics. Look at what's going on with Hamas and Israel. A lot of people in this world thinks politics is the problem. Maybe we need to go away from politics. Maybe we need to try another. They tried outside of the box. Maybe they failed. Maybe they failed because of sabotage. Because we all saw what was going on with, with, with Big Baller Brand in the news. There was a lot of real slick stuff that was going on. We saw it. We saw it. We're like, whoa, that's kind of kind of fishy that they did them like that. We saw what happened on ESPN. We saw it. So all I'm saying is there could have been another element. Did you guys investigate the other side? There's a lot of your opinions, but what about the other side? And I got to go. I'm, I got to bounce. Peace, guys. Peace, guys. Okay, okay. Well, let, 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 let's respond. Let's respond one-on-one. -on -one. Let's respond one-on-one. -on -one. I'm going to bring up Yvette. Yvette, what is your say, uh, response to that call? Let, let me just say this. I don't even know what like, I don't even know, even if even he, he brought up Israel and Hamas and said, maybe take politics out of that. Sometimes I feel like there are people in our group that are suffering from a form of psychosis because nobody is taking nobody is taking politics out of what's going on in Gaza. Like everybody, as a matter of fact, they're trying to navigate a ceasefire through the U.N. That's politics. So when you say politics, take politics out of it. Politics is in everything. Politics is in your drinking water. What when it's dirty, when it's flint, and what they allowed, and what the EPA does, what the EPA environmental racism. The EPA has not allowed one, has not filed one lawsuit for environmental racism. Has not recommended that for the Justice Department. So stop telling me politics is not involved and take politics out of it. The reason that we're in this space is that we believe we can do stuff outside of politics and people like you are the problem nobody's doing anything outside of politics. as somebody who's worked on capitol hill nobody's doing anything everybody's there from the hog farmer from the banker to the person who makes your widgets to the person who makes your glasses to your dentist who are keeping the other people out of doing dentistry everybody is in politics so when you tell me that politics has to be taken out of it you are expressly telling me that you're ignorant ignorant of how the world works not just america but the world and that is problematic. You should learn. I have a book club. Join up. We can talk about it. But you have a lot of reading to do and a lot of understanding to do to, 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 to move around in the world as an adult. This is something I expect to hear from somebody in fourth or fifth grade. Yeah, and I, I want to hear from a Tone on this point. But even, even on the most basic level, you cannot take politics out of business. It is my profession. What I do, I work with people with small businesses as an advisor to simply get their business license. They have to deal with their local government. They have to deal with politics to even operate the business on day one. So you'll never be able to separate politics and business. They are always intimately intertwined, period. JT, I, got, I, got, I can't stay too much longer, but let me say this. I gave a story from 
the dude that owns the Weather Channel about fiber optic cables and how black folks have been locked out of even owning that stuff, the cables, the cable lines. Mm -hmm. He came back and talked about how Big Baller Brand was being locked out and he didn't left out race. He done left out race and he done left out politics. It was the same story, though. So what he what I'm telling you is that there's a severe psychotic issue around race. That's what this is pointing out. So basically they're post-racial, but they still believe in blackness. But then when you say that blackness is the reason they're being shut out, they'll say, well, black people can do business too, anyway. And they don't know nobody doing business. And I tell you, I just talked to the dude that on the Weather Channel, and he said that ain't true. That's why he got a suit. I'm just telling you, I'm trying to come, I'm just trying to give you what was told to me. I'm not guessing. So I'm saying that instead of him coming on and saying, hey, Tom, you're right. This sounds just like the fiber optics sounds just like what happened to Better Business with the BBB when they tried to do this and Nike tried to shut them out. So there's a comprehension level. So we might not might as well not talk. You might as well not call in. Go ahead. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, and we gotta stop being conspiratorial. Like, I can't prove a negative. You don't know something might have happened. If you know something, bring the evidence here. Other than that, it's just a theory. I don't operate on theories. I operate on what you, what we have factually in front of us. Anything could happen anywhere. So, whenever something fails, well, you don't know, they could have set him up. Stop being conspiratorial unless we have some evidence of that. And sometimes you do have evidence. There are things that point in a different direction. There are conversations that were had. You read an article. If you don't have that, don't, don't be conspiratorial to me because it just gets in the way of the facts that I'm trying to present. JT, I'm going to slide on out of here. I appreciate you having me. Thank, thank you so much for coming up. All right, we're going to try to get through these callers. Let's get straight to the questions. We're not going to be here all night. We have... Uh, do, 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 do. We have Zach, I believe. We have Zach in the back. So let me bring Zach up. You are live on the air with Pocket Watching with JT. What's going on, Zach? What's going on, JT? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Uh, long listener of the show, big fan. Love what you do. Uh, seeing your growth uh, started when you only had like 2,000 like followers. So I've been here for a while. A couple things real quick. I used to do a basketball podcast. Bottom line with LeVar Ball. He wanted a mm -hmm. vision for his sons. He was successful in getting two of his sons drafted to the NBA, but he mm -hmm. didn't want to work with anybody. He didn't want to work with Nike. He didn't want to work with Adidas. He didn't work with Reebok. And as a former basketball player, player at the professional level, if you're not going to spend the type of money or even work with those brands, you're not even getting the type of technology that goes into those shoes. And his ego mm -hmm. got in the way. And bottom line, it might have cost his son. I'm here in Chicago. might have cost Lonzo his career because they're saying the shoes might have ruined that So. That's that's that with ball. Uh, I ran a trucking business uh, and I laugh at people. I, la I saw your last show. Um, <laughs> all that stuff is public knowledge, man. Um, it's the most regulated business. I laugh at people where they think they're just going to jump into it. Um, you can see me on camera. I'm back at my old job back in law enforcement because my truck business went bankrupt. And I think mm -hmm. what people don't don't talk about when running a business is how much luck you need sometimes. Like things just have to go right. Like I couldn't help my truck went down. I couldn't help that COVID happen and they were price gouging parts. And just like you couldn't get auto parts, mm -hmm. you can't get truck parts. And you're spending this money and you're getting this uh this um this this price gouge over here. Um right. I did all my due diligence. I'm I'm educated like you, history major, researched all that, and I still miss things. They still got me with a contract with certain things. And it's just mistakes that's going to be made. And at the end of the day, my capital ran dry. And now me and my wife are working our way up out of that. But this whole mm -hmm. idea that you're just going to get into business and don't do no research and then also think you're not going to fail is crazy to me. And then to the last points that's being made, I will say this. I will wish that in Black America we can get back to a balanced uh, pre-civil rights movement and the end of segregation. Like, we're talking about big corporations and fiber optics and all that. And I agree with all that. But also along the way, we lost the grassrootsness of our community and the community-based businesses that we once had. And a lot of mm -hmm. it, we don't want to talk about that as a people because when certain generations got older, they the kids didn't want to take all of the businesses or they sold the business or this happened. You know, I give mm -hmm. you a quick story. It's a guy on the south side here in Chicago in Roseland. Look it up. They call it the Wild Hunters had a pharmacy and a grocery store there for almost 40 years. The man mm -hmm. just retired, had to sell it to another group of people because his son is not a pharmacist. Nobody take over that business. So it has to be some type of bit, uh, balance of 
not only going after the big play like the last gentleman was talking about, but we don't have any neighborhood or grassroots businesses that segregation forced us to have. And I think we also need to start talking about that as well. I'm going to lend, lend it to you guys. I appreciate you having me on. Much success for oh, what man. you do. Thank you so much. Do you want to touch on that? Well, really, well, really quickly, I just want to say, you know, mm -hmm. I, I agree with part of what he said, right? In the terms of, I saw an article about, um, you know, they were having, they were talking about, oh, black farmers, the kids didn't want to take over the farm, they wanted to do business, right? Um, or go make a million dollars or whatever. And I, I agree with that partially. But the other part of that is, we don't talk about how they were sending black farmers dead chickens, right? And and, mm -hmm. and so that they wouldn't be successful at farming. We don't we don't really want to talk about who is the head of the Department of Agriculture, which is politics, right? And what that person has to do to make sure that those farmers have act have access to capital and loans. And that's never happened for them. They haven't had access to capital and loans because they've desired and wanted for those farms to fail. So I think I agree with like there have been businesses that we have been unwilling to take over, but there's also been a government that has been unfair to us. And has tried to make sure that we fail and that so that we can't compete with white people in this country. And so we will be the shoes that they wear to be successful and win the race, but never be the people that actually secure wealth for our own communities. And so I think politics always has to be a part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here we go. We got a couple more left. Let me get to Chris. Chris, you are live on the air. What's going on? Hey, you know, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Uh, hey, you know, uh... Uh, I'm from Detroit, where the uh, the uh, medium housing value is fifty-seven thousand dollars, and um, I have I own a business in Detroit, and I want to bring attention to you, and I wanted to see what is your opinion on this. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these black men around here have these charges and. Uh, challengers and stuff like that ranging between sixty to hundred and twenty thousand uh dollars. -huh. When I ask for a business loan, I can't get it. But an 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 something year old can get a seventy thousand dollar loan and drive around in a city where the mm -hmm. medium house in medium housing value is fifty seven thousand, but he can get a loan so easy because of the financial trickiness of it, you know, seven year and all that. Right. And I was wondering, is it is it that they are funding they they are financing certain aspect of black, um, how can I say, uh, the black culture? Like, well, we're not going to finance a business or a store for you, but we'll give you a car. Mm -hmm. And right, I was. I now, listen, I, I know this question. I get this question a lot, and I'm going to break it up in two parts. I'm going to play the role that I play. I'm going to take on the side of business, and I'm going to allow Yvette to take on the side of the politic side of it. All right? So uh, this is purely business that I'm talking about here. Okay? She's going to get the other end. I'm taking pure business. The reason why a person is, is much easier for a person to get a loan for an automobile than they can for a small business is because that automobile is collateral. So if I sell you this car for 60 something thousand dollars or whatever, you pull off the lot, I kind of already know that the uh, value of that car is going to go down. I bake that into the loan. I know that the value is going to go down. So I have you do a down payment or whatever. Okay, great. Let's say a few months down the road or a few years down the road, you cannot make your payments. A lot of you out there are experiencing that right now. That's why one of the top Google terms in the United States is how to give my car back, right? A lot of you are in the position where you cannot afford your car payments. But if I repo that car, I take the car back, I sell it at an auction, I'm probably still making a slim, but I'm still making a profit on it because I have all the payments that you made before, I have your down payment, I then took the car back, sold it, and now I'm most likely whole in that situation. What happens with your small business? Many people with small businesses, they want capital, operating capital. Right. It's like, man, if I just get thirty, forty thousand dollars, I can get my business going. Operating capital is one of the hardest types of loans for you to get because operating capital is just money. 
You come up with an idea and I say, yeah, that's a great idea. Here's the money. Go do it. Now, it's different from if you want to start a trucking company and you get a loan for a truck. OK, the truck is collateral. Right. But if you're in a situation where you need 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars to start a business, when people know most small businesses are going to fail, it's harder for on the business side to say, yeah, I'm willing to give you a loan for that business over giving you a loan for that car because I can see you really want that car. I can see that you're probably going to put yourself in a situation where you forego certain things like putting money away in an emergency savings fund. You forego putting money into a 401k or a Roth IRA. You'll live paycheck to paycheck to keep up the appearance of being wealthy to make those car payments. And if you stop making those car payments, I repo the car, I take it back and I sell it. That's the business aspect. Now I'm going to turn it over to my sister for the other side. Great, great. Let me just say, <laughs> you know, one of the first things if you if you say, hey, I uh, I want to get a, I want to do business. Right. And I want to do a startup. And you come in smiling. The first thing they say <laughs> is, well, just just go around and get five thousand dollars from your friends and you get fifty thousand dollars real quick and you start up that way. And that way you really get to see. Right. And that is the expectation that if if, if people around you believe in you. You will be able to, before you take capital from anybody, you will be able to tap into your social capital, mama, daddy, friends, all mm -hmm. of that. The problem is because we are racialized cast, we don't have that social capital. Our friends are tapped out. Now, there's a historic reason for that. We shouldn't blame ourselves, but that's the reason that you need some kind of government intervention because no bank is going to take that risk because they know better than some of us know that we do have a stigma tied to tied to race in America, right? Tied to our lineage in this country. There is a stigma attached to that and nobody's going to invest in that. Even if you go to look at some of these big stock markets, they say, well, nobody wants to give me the money. Nobody wants to give me the big accounts. That's what you hear black people say when you there have been lawsuits about it well you know why you don't have the social capital to bring in your own big accounts either you are supposed to be networking with these people and have things and to exchange with them and you're supposed to bring in a big fish of your own and they give you a big fish over here you have no big fish and we don't have any big fish because of what we've been through in this country but that's a problem money gets money it's just the same way right now you have a whole bunch of high yield savings accounts and and if you want to get five percent to each west is some get you right now for four point five percent easy mm -hmm. money you got a lot of money just put it over there and sit right if you got a hundred thousand dollars to sit they'll give you five percent where everybody else is getting four point three four point four money begets money in this country and people have a lot of it and that's why you're not getting a loan because people know you're a risk and you're a risk not because of anything that we've done to with this about what this country has done to us but if you want to get out of that government has to intervene and say listen we have to fix what we did to these people but that's why they're not giving you a loan Great point. Great point. Here we go. Going to the next call. I believe we have Raya. I think I'm saying it right. Raya, you are live on the air with Pocket Watching with JT. What's going on? Hey, JT. It's it's Ray Camille. Ray, what's going on? <laughs> Nothing much. I wanted to speak about the, the downside of owning a business. Mm -hmm. My aunt has several daycare centers in New York. She was able to buy commercial property and she bought her home. At the same time, while she had this business, she failed to pay her taxes. And what people don't understand is if you don't pay your taxes, those fines and those penalties will quickly add up. Mm -hmm. So my aunt purchased her commercial property for the business for about $98,000, mm -hmm. a major win for her. When she was older, she got into tax problems because she'd never paid the labor tax. So she started paying her teachers out of, I don't know where she got the money from, but she never paid the Department of Labor for those labor tax. Okay. They caught up with her and they just compiled and started adding up. She had to sell the building. She sold the building for $1.6 million and got nothing at the closing table because she owed the IRS $1.7 million. Once she sold the building, she still had a debt to the IRS and then her million dollar home is now in a reverse mortgage because she still owes them some money. So we have to be so very careful. You wanna own a business, pay your employees, pay your labor tax, pay all the taxes that they ask you for and make sure you have good accounting. The last thing is 
everybody in the chat, there's about almost 2,000 of us. Hit the like button so JT can do his thing. <laughs> Appreciate you, JT. Thank you so much. That, that's a great point. I mean, it, it, it speaks again to the underfunding. Like, it's like we can get right up to the door. We uh -huh. right up to the door, we can turn the door knob, but we don't have enough to actually go all the way into the building and function in the right way. We think we can stay right at the margins and we end up seeing tragedies like that because most likely that business was underfunded. And also there's a lack of probably having the right advisors in place telling her the right things because once again, we are in a community of hustle advisors. Like they're trying to teach you ways to cut corners to not pay your taxes and you end up losing everything. Well, think and, and the other the other part of it, those liens are public, right? And so mm -hmm. and so so people are gonna lowball you now for mm -hmm. for that for the cost. So that 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 building might have been if you hadn't had that on that house, those liens or whatever on that building, that building might have went for four million. But because they know. What you need the money for now? We low volume. We know we know you need the one point. We know you need the one point six. So we know you need the one point seven. We're gonna come in just a little bit lower, right? They do that. Like that's that's how that's how business works. It's cutthroat. So you're not even getting the worth of the building until you can pay the lien off. You know, so that they people can't see that this 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 building is under lien. So that becomes a catch twenty two for you. How you get out of that? Yeah, yeah. All right, we've got only three callers left. Please, no one else hit the link. We got three callers left, and we're gonna wrap this thing up. So we have Ados North. Ados North, you're live on air. What's going? You're on? live on air. What's going on? Hey, JT. Hey, man. Good, good, good. Go right ahead. Good, good, good. Go right ahead. So yeah, oh, whatever, um, I'm not. Whatever. Hold on. Real quick. Got him. Got him. <laughs> whatever. Look, Ados North. I'm, I'm taking you out. Whatever. You must be listening to me on two devices or whatever it is. Contrary to popular belief, I don't like the sound of my own voice. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the next caller. You get whatever you need to get fixed so where you're only listening to me through the device that you're on in the chat, right? And I'm going to get you back in because you know I do not like the sound of my own voice. Even though you, many people think I do, I do not. Let me bring up Charles. Charles, you're live on air. What's going on? Hey, how's it going, JT? How's it going, Mr. Vet? Um, can y'all hear me? Yeah, you sound a little far away, but I'm working with you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can switch it to where it's just my phone because I have it on my car. Is that much better? Much better. Go right ahead. Hey. Don't get in an accident now. Is that better? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, perfect. So, uh, JT, I, I wanted to talk about um, specifically the basketball space. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I'll, you know, a little, real quick, I'll get to the other part. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, y'all talked about or Yvette talked about po uh, politics within it. And there's mm -hmm. so many things going on behind the scenes. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have kids, but, you know, when you have kids and your kids are in higher sports uh, um, situations, mm -hmm. like, uh, for example, you got high school kids that might make it to the NBA or you got some real legit pros in these high schoolers. Mm -hmm. This situation, AAU, it gets real difficult with these parents. You'll have parents who every single last one of them think that their child is the next person. Their child is right. the next LeBron James. Their child is the next, you know, going to take over. And mm -hmm. so at that time, that's where all of this, you know, monetization of this child comes in at, at the high school level. So mm -hmm. by the time they get to, you know, the, the NBA it's it's just blown out of proportion because they're going off of what I'm what I'm projected to get. Now, uh, uh, Lavar, shout out to you. You raised three sons who, even though the last one didn't make it to the NBA, he made it to the professional level at basketball, which is mm -hmm. still very good. There are not many people that do that. Right. So, um, you know that part right there. I think if, if you could do a whole video on that by yourself, JT, in terms of what's going on in some of these sports spaces and how a lot of mismanagement, uh, you got parents thinking that they know everything, man, you'll be interested to see how much of that is actually happening. Uh, I know you have an email set up, so if you want, I can send you a whole bunch of links where you might find yeah. some interesting stories going on. Mm -hmm. Like I got stories about Trey Young's father who, you know, they, they did a whole bunch of crazy stuff, but I can send that to your email. 
Yeah, um, shoot, shoot it to me. Shoot it to me. I want to I wanna check that out because ultimately, the way I look at it, and it's, it's been my experience, a lot of these parents, obviously, they love their children. I'm not, I'm not going to take that away, so I'm going to put that on the record. But a lot of these parents also are looking at their child as their retirement account because of mismanagement, because of a lot of things within their environment. They have not set themselves up in a situation to be uh, financially stable. Let's say that. Right. So the child is their lottery ticket. The child is their 401k with two point five million dollars in it. So they are overly aggressive and you know pushing the hype in this dream of being the next superstar because if it does not come true, they have no plan B. So that that I've seen that a lot. Have you, Yvette, have you seen this yeah, well, over dramatic well, sense of making my child a superstar? Yeah, because they 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 feel I have to have a way out. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I have to make my kid be my way out. And so and I was I saw a great story earlier today. I think Antonio sent it to me about about these kids who get CTE before before they even oh, yeah. go to college. Right. They get CTE mm -hmm. from elementary school. They get CTE from high school and they never made it to the league. One of them committed suicide and told his dad, hey, look at my brain. And he was white. So you really don't even understand what you're putting your children through in order. And this was football. You know, it happens in soccer, too, but that's not necessarily, you know, what we do. But I'm just saying that, like, you put right. your kid through that to do that. And there's also this idea that there's also this idea that there's no self-awareness. So, you, you know, uh, Mr. Ball may have done a great job at raising his sons, uh, you know, with, with athletic ability to be great basketball players. That may be something if you want to do a camp, that's probably something that you're great at. You're probably not great at selling shoes. Right. And so there's no self-awareness among people like, what am I good at? What do I do? How do I excel? It's not necessarily that. And I think we're putting our kids through a lot to try to make them what politics should do. And so they won't do politics. But I'm going to be at I'm going to be at the game. I'm going to push him hard and tell him he's going to take some licks and he's got to throw up and get back out there. No, that's not your politics. And your kid is not your lotto ticket. Mm, great point. Here we go. Last two callers. We got John and Adolph North. Let me bring up John. John, you're live on air. What's going on? Hey, how you doing, JT? Um, so a couple of things. So one of the things that really stuck out to me with this whole big ball of brand is like the whole concept of operational excellence mm -hmm. in business. I feel like in regards to like when people are trying to start any type of enterprise, especially something that's going because they're a little bit more well funded than the average, but like you know, when you have a company that you're trying to put forward in the public, you know, the people that you have representing that company who are key people, they're usually as a, a long laundry list of due diligence that you have to do. Like this whole like executive search firms that go to, you can't get the homeboy network to run your company. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Remember on, on in Living Color where you had the um, yeah. homeboy shopping network? You can't do that. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think I've, I've I've had this conversation many times growing up in the South Bronx. Like I got one of the challenges that I, I I find that when we try to get into business, mm -hmm. is with this whole, you know, I'm going to get over concept. Like if you go to New York right now, like I just came back from New York a couple of weeks ago. You know, there's businesses still in New York that they won't accept debit cards. All they accept is cash, because they're still trying to, like I said, get away from paying payroll taxes. And right, yeah. the, the the crazy part about it is, and JT, you probably get speeches. Better than anyone because your license acts like my ex is a is an attorney. She does, you know, state planning and stuff like that, and like mm -hmm. all the different benefits that can come from being like, say, for instance, if you're a sole owner of a, your own corporation, things like you can get a solo four hundred one k, or like you can put an absurd amount of money away into like retirement plans, like a defined benefit plan, yeah. and we don't take advantage. Of it. So instead of trying to hide the money you can actually benefit from the existing tax system and put more money away. But people don't yeah. don't look at it that way. Yeah, because that's not sexy. And, that, and that's a great point. That's not sexy. There's people, once again, there's people online who claim to be these gurus who are telling you all the ways that you can spend your money to pay less in taxes, right? Buy a G-Wagon, do this, do that. You can you know, write off all your personal expenses. Well, I represent people before the IRS for audits. I'm telling you, most of that junk 
does not work. But even if you are, you know, constantly making these business purchases so that you reduce your taxable income, you end up functionally broke when you could have opened up a solo 401k. I think this past year, you can put up to like $66,000 between your contributions and the business's contributions or a SEP IRA. You're talking about $66,000 into your own retirement account that reduces your current year tax liability. You don't want to do that because no one can see you driving around in a solo 401k with $66,000, but you can pull up to the family reunion in a G-Wagon and feel like a big shot. That's that's the major difference. That's why more people are willing to spend their money on the cool stuff rather than actually find a tax strategy that is within the law, but it's not sexy. Well, you remember what happened with what was it? Gladys Knight's son, Gladys Knight Chicken and Waffles, right? He was he was he was he was over there, and he and, the, and then the people came down and said he owed all this money and all this bad, all kind of stuff was going on, right? All kind of improprieties, I guess I would say. Um, and the thing is, you know, he was driving this really nice car and this really expensive car. And the thing is, you could have probably had a nice life off the business. It just mm -hmm. wouldn't have been an extravagant life, right? It would have right. just been a nice life. And I just don't think, JT, we want nice lives anymore. We 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 have we have created appetites based off of stuff we see on TV. And so we don't just want to have a home and two cars and a, a, a life where we're stable. You know, well, we have a few hundred thousand dollars in an account and hopefully at the end of life, a few million. We don't even want that. No, if we can't spend it and show people like, look what I'm in, look what I'm wearing. Like it becomes it, it's, it's that's the trap for us. And I don't think we want nice lives anymore. I think we want to show off the accoutrements of 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 a yes. here life. That's yes. Not thing. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you're so on it. I refer to it when I'm talking to clients and whatnot. I refer to it as financial pornography. Right. It's finance. It's financial pornography. Now, give me a second to explain, because some people may not get what I mean. here. It's financial pornography, because the same way that you may have a 15 or 16 year old boy who is addicted to porn, they don't understand what real intimacy is. They watch the video and they think that's intimacy because they don't have a real relationship. All they know is that, you know, they watch the videos online and that's their mindset of what a relationship with a woman is. That's fake. The actors will tell you we're faking. The actors will even tell you a lot of the part of the scenes is actually painful. It's not even we don't even enjoy it, but we know that's what gets the clicks and views. Now, let me bring it back to finance. A lot of the people who you try to model your life after. Oh, they're driving, they're flying around in private jets. They're pulling up in a Rolls Royce. They live in a house with 12 rooms and eight bathrooms. Most of them are suffering in silence. It's just made to make you think it's cool so that you overextend yourself, so that you try to imitate their financial lifestyle, which they're not even enjoying themselves. Because your spending fuels this economy, right? If you stop spending your surplus dollars on material things and you put money in an emergency savings fund, you pay down debt, there are total industries that will crumble if you do get off the debt hamster wheel. So it's yeah, it's to me, it's it's financial pornography, it's people who don't have a real relationship on what real wealth is. They look at it as like almost like a cartoon or some weird thing of, oh yeah, you're not really wealthy if you can't buy out a store. You're and, not really wealthy if you can't fly private. And and the thing about it is, JT, let me just say this last little point. Mm. I don't even think people think about the things they think they want, right? Mm. So people say, oh my God, I want a Ferrari. Well, I'm 5'10 and I've been a runner for a, a large part of my life. Like, I don't, my knees don't want to be getting up from no low car, right? I don't care what kind of low car, I like to slide down. So you don't even think about, you just think about it because you see somebody else in that car. 
You don't even think about, is that something I would really want to drive day to day? I can't park nowhere because now I look like bait. So I can't even go to none of the places that I may like going to, right? Somebody going to slip a little apple tag in my bag. Like, is that really the life I want? We don't even think about that. We just see somebody else driving it and, and, and decide that that's cool and decide now that we want a $400,000 car. We don't even think it through. It's so it's so sad. It's, most of it is like you can't even afford it, right? Even if you're lucky enough to get approved for the auto loan for like a Lambo, what happens when you run over a nail? What happens when uh, the headlight goes out? You don't want those troubles. You don't. You know, you're used to your Chevy where you're able to get a light bulb for like eight or twelve dollars. You're not trying to pay for a couple hundred dollars of a light bulb. Like these are things and yourself. maintenance <laughs> that we don't account for, but we desire a ridiculous wealth lifestyle when we don't really understand what goes into it. But let me bring up our last caller. We have Adolph North, North live on the air. Are you hearing me now? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. I can also can hear awesome. me. So I'm so sorry. I can't do it. I can't do it. I drive myself crazy. So let me let let me give I guess an opportunity to say her last remarks, and I also want you to teach everyone how they can join ADOS. Well, I want to thank you, JT, for having me on and just having this conversation. I believe conversations like this have to happen, right? We have we have this YouTube space that's just inundated with nonsense, get rich quick schemes, <laughs> all sorts of things. So I appreciate. I want everybody to know that I appreciate the work you do here. You deserve your hundred k. You know, I appreciate the fact that they're letting you get there. Every time I get to eighty seven, they rewind. So I appreciate <laughs> the fact. And listen, so I appreciate the fact that you got there and like people are looking. Like people are paying attention to what you're saying and what you're doing. And I think that is wonderful. I, I, you know, I think, and I hope that's the beginning of a real accountability YouTube space. I would like to see five more, six more. I think there's room for everybody in this space. And I just love the fact that you're here. Um, I love the fact that you have me on. I love the fact that we're having conversations that are beneficial and, and are not usury and, and we're not exploiting our community. You know, I, I just there are very few platforms that I feel comfortable co going on and having a conversation because I feel like they're exploitive. Um, and I appreciate you not being one of those people and, and calling yourself pocket watcher because that's what you're supposed to do. Like you are supposed to look at pockets and say, what are you doing to fill your pockets? Or are you exploiting somebody? So I absolutely appreciate that, you know, and you deserve every, you deserve all the flowers that everybody's giving you, you know, so so take that. Um, you deserve the flowers and the plaque and all that good stuff. And I just want to <laughs> tell everybody, I just want to tell everybody that it's up to you to keep this channel and the other channels that you appreciate going. You know, I know those of you all who are in the chat right now, y'all are y'all are JT Pocket Watcher fans. Y'all are in here. Um, just make sure you stay in here, right? Because that's the thing that keeps this going. One of the things that happens in this YouTube space is that eyeballs tend to go everywhere. We go where we get distracted, and now we over here. We forgot we used to watch this show or watch that show. So make sure that you that you subscribe and you stay committed to content that you're committed to. Um, we have launched chapters across the country. The ADOS Advocacy Foundation is a political organization that is dedicated um, to American descendants of slavery. That's those of us in this country who descend from slaves. Uh, we have as our core reparations and a black agenda, a transformative black agenda where the politics benefit us, uplift us collectively. One of the things I always say is that we either rise together and fall together. We are sober minded and clear eyed about our politics and our politics is specifically for us, specifically for you. Um, if you, you know, the black agenda includes everybody. So we really want everybody to be engaged. We have had chapter meetings. Like I said, we are nationwide now. You can go to joinados.com to actually join our, join our membership. And if you want to catch me, um, Breaking Brown on YouTube, that's where you can find me. I'm there all the time. Uh, Antonio Moore, who's on, he's at Tone Talks. So you can find both of us at our respective YouTube channels. I'm on Wednesday nights um, at, I'm at Wednesday nights at 10, um, no, 930, I'm sorry. And Monday and Thursday, I'm on Patreon uh, at 10, 15. Um, patreon.com slash why Carnell. So if you want to support, if you want to show up and watch, we have a great time and we talk politics. So if politics is your thing, show up and we're going to have some fun. <laughs> and it should be your All thing. Right. <laughs> th 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 thank you so much. I appreciate it. For those of you who are watching this in the replay, a link to join ados.com is in the description of this video. Make sure that you hit the link, go check them out. The work that they're doing. I tell people all the time, I'm a personal financial advisor. 
I went to school to give people one-on-one -on -one advice of how I can help you improve your individual financial situation. They don't teach us in business school how to get the financial situation of entire community of people together. That takes something else that is not in my toolkit, but it is <laughs> in events and tones. So we got to support that type of work. So listen, political science major, <laughs> political science major over here is account major. <laughs> so we, we, we both serve the community, but in very different ways. <laughs> and and I, thank you so much for all of you who are still here. Normally, I only do one show a week, but I'm doing a pop up show tomorrow mm. because we've got to talk about this crazy MLM slash what I believe to be a Ponzi scheme that Brother Ben X and a lot of other people. But the reason why I talk about Brother Ben X is because he's the most famous person who is promoting it within the black community. As I warned him about a month or so ago, the federal government and the state uh, government's security boards are going to stop this company. And as of, I believe, yesterday, the state of Texas, I believe California and other states have sent that company a cease and desist. I think we need to have a conversation about why schemes like this are, number one, obvious. I mean, that 5% weekly returns? <laughs> you don't have to go to business school to know that 5% weekly returns are unrealistic. That means you're robbing a bank every week. <laughs> <laughs> but still, there's people who, and, and shouts out to uh, Third Chapter. Thank you so much. I appreciate the support. And I want to make sure I put up on the screen here uh, the website so y'all know y'all going to the right website. Um, we got to have a conversation, and I'm going I'm to pop in tomorrow, not super long, but we're going to break down how you can avoid things like this. I mean, it makes no sense. I feel for the many people who put their money into what they thought was a great investment opportunity, but ultimately, according to now, not just pocket watching with JT, but the government believes that this is a investment scheme that is harming people. So we're going to have that conversation tomorrow. So if you're free, I'm going to be right back here, same time, different day tomorrow at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm going to have a conversation about this crypto company, GS Partners, and how the federal, I mean, the state governments, and I'm sure soon the federal government is going to shut this thing down. So I want to thank you. I go to joinados.com, click the button, join, participate. If you really want to see a change in community, you want to see better business, business and politics are related. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. The Pocket Watcher is out. Y'all have a great and safe weekend, but I will be back tomorrow. I see you guys later.